funding offered to deal with sorcery-related violence. Another positive COVID-19 case in Port Moresby. And St. John conducts nationwide awareness. Good evening and thanks for joining me for National MTV News. I'm Shomain Poreambeb. In 2015, the Sorcery Accusation Related Violence or SAV National Action Plan was approved by the government with funding of 3 million kina annually. However, no funding was released to the Justice Department until this year. The fight against SAV received a massive boost as the Department of Justice and Attorney General or DJAG signed four agreements to support implementing partners. The Department of Justice and Attorney General is the lead agency for sorcery-related issues in the country. In the past, there has been no formal agreement signed by the Justice Department with implementing partners in regards to the fight against sorcery accusation-related violence. Yesterday marked a significant milestone as four implementing partners signed these agreements. Now, as you know, uh, the Department of Justice is basically focused on delivering justice. We are not expecting a number of matters um, that affect the rule of law. And so we depend very much on partners. Since the conversation started in 2009, a national action plan was created. In 2015, the government, through the National Executive Council, approved the action plan and allocated some funding to address sorcery accusation-related violence. But none of that funding was received by the Justice Department until this year. This agreement now is to implement the component that the government promised in 2015 and work closely with communities who are affected with sorcery-related issues. It's the impact that we want to deal with. Then okay, you have your own belief, but how you express your belief against another person must be done with respect. You must respect lives. You must respect communities. You must respect the rule of law. Child Fund Consultative Implementation and Monitoring Council, or CIMC, Tribal Foundation, and One Talk Radio Light will be the implementing partners under this agreement. And that's why we're putting resources and effort into trying to address issues that might threaten the safety and security of children. But some provinces that have gone, they have, sorcery is not that their priority. How can we make that a priority from here? Sorcery is a belief, but the violence associated with, the, with, with, with sorcery is, is a crime. Give the Justice Department time to come and talk on air, live, and uh, address these issues. These organizations have been working tirelessly in the past years to help victims of sorcery accusation-related violence. The signing of the agreements will see a positive push in addressing this vital issue. Lillian Soperakenea, National MTV News. Another positive COVID-19 case in Port Moresby brings the number to five positive cases this week alone. The fifth positive case becomes PNG's 16th coronavirus case in total. While no updates have been given on the recovery process of the three previous cases from Murray Barracks in Port Moresby, Prime Minister James Marape stressed the need for the public to be aware of community transmission. Addressing the media yesterday evening outside the National Command Centre, the Prime Minister confirmed that the fifth positive case is another lab technician from the Central Public Health Laboratory. Four other laboratory workers tested positive earlier. All five are in isolation. The latest thing, back to back, in fact, uh, the last cluster in June, 
Well, we established three cases from my right. Today, the cluster in July, we're seeing five cases back to back, all in the same workplace percent. Uh, those who are uh, uh, picked from amongst workers at the, the uh, testing facilities or in Europe, those who are involved in the testing area. I'm just asking our company to remain sensitive. COVID-19 is here. Uh, today we've just come back from our briefing. We're asking for, because of now the evidence pointing towards community transmission, uh, we're asking the community controller and our health team to step up testing uh, to ensure we go deeper and see. Apart from the test that we've done last one. For instance, the CVHL or Central Public Health Laboratory will undergo a thorough cleansing and disinfection in the coming days to ensure we follow all the infection prevention and control measures. In the interim, testing for COVID-19 samples from provinces will be done at IMR Goroka, Singapore and or Australia, or Brisbane, Australia. The identification of these cases provides evidence that the risk of COVID-19 is very high. It is important that, that we do not speculate at this stage about sources of infection. But I have tasked the surveillance and infection control, prevention control team to investigate immediately. The magnitude 7.0 earthquake that was felt across the country yesterday caused minor damages in northern and central provinces. The epicenter, 120 kilometers northwest of Popondata, was at a depth of 80 kilometers. It was felt in parts of the country, including Wanigela village in Abao district of central province. A number of houses built over the sea collapsed while others suffered minor damage. Images. The earthquake is a result of interaction between the Solomon Sea and Australian plates. No injuries or deaths have been reported. Basic first aid is a vital life skill that Papua New Guineans need to possess. St. John Ambulance PNG, since it opened office in 1976, continues to advocate and drive first aid awareness throughout the country. After a week-long community awareness program this week, St. John held a basic first aid workshop for members of the media in Port Moresby. Representatives from the mainstream media houses, including MTV, the two dailies and FM Central, were taken through basic first aid skills for both adults and children. If I don't block off the nose and then I blow through the mouth, my breathing is not effective. I cannot revive that patient because the air is es escaping again from the nose. A crucial medical skill that most Papua New Guineans are not familiar with. We're going to be doing wounds and bleeding, um, also fracture management, spinal you know, care, caring for the head and neck. Um, people really need to know how to you know, remove someone if there's a motor vehicle accident or anything. We're going to be doing snake bite management because we have a lot of snake bites here in Papua New Guinea. Media plays a vital role in educating the public and this is one way of teaching them to teach others. MTV's Kids Corner Crew participated in the awareness workshop and was intrigued on the efforts taken by St. John staff when attending to an emergency. Knowing a first aid skill is good, like it's a life skill and also they can practice this when they're out in the field you know they, they will come across you know any emergency scenario and at least they can be able to you know know what to do in case emergency strikes Zoe Saulep also coordinates St. John's First Aid in Schools program. With the support of the Sir Brian Bell Foundation, this program teaches basic first aid to grade 9 students from selected schools in NCD. With St. John already operating in Kokopo, the same concept will be facilitated in schools in East New Britain province. Because not only are we doing the First Aid in Schools program, which is um, fully funded by Sir Brian Bell Foundation, we're venturing into the communities as well because that's important we need um, people in the community to take ownership of our health 
Youths in Mendy Town have been urged to engage in community initiative projects and restore the image of the Southern Highlands capital. This week, the Provincial Assembly released 400,000 kina to 15 youth groups living on the fringes of Mendy Town. Governor William Poe says youths are encouraged to be agents of change by participating in development projects at all levels of government. Since 2017, the Southern Highlands capital, Mendy, has seen violence, killings and rampage by youth triggered by politics and ethnic differences. The Southern Highlands provincial government now plans to engage youths around Mendy to participate in development projects. A spokesperson says a youth must take ownership and allow development agendas to roll out. A sum of 400,000 kina was presented by Governor William Powi and the provincial administration at Igor Building this week. This money will be shared equally among 15 youth groups established in the Mandy urban area. Governor Powi says youths must be empowered. now starting to do small. As small as it is, but it will have bigger impact. It depends on you, huh? how you behave. That usually is the four hundred thousand. So I think this is the this is the uh, approach Miblo is taking. Uh, it has a bigger connotation or bigger foundational work. But. Southern Highlands Provincial Government is investing heavily in road, airport, bridges, and in the agriculture sector to transform the province. However, youths have been at the forefront, crippling the development phase. We encourage all youths to be agents of change and see development agendas being achieved. Let the government do its primary and traditional business of service delivery in schools, in health, in education, in road infrastructure, and you, my people, go and work for yourself to put money in your in your pocket so you can liberate yourself from the bondage you are in. Jaglo Pava Jr. National MTV News. This is MTV National News. We'll be back with more stories after the break. Welcome back. Norton Province is severely facing shortage in policeman power. Governor Gary Jufa says only 67 officers are working despite needing 367 more to do policing in the province. Jufa says police in the province are stretched with capacity issues. He hopes the police hierarchy is reaching out to formalize recruitment and deployment of officers to serve the province. The ratio of policemen to citizens, as stipulated by the United Nations, is 1 to 400. But in Papua New Guinea, it's 1 to 1,200. And in Oro province, it's 1 to 2,100. We have a staff ceiling of 367, and we only have 67 policemen at the moment. So our policemen are quite stretched, They're struggling to meet the demands of managing the province. Uh, you know, I'm confident that the police commissioner and the police minister are working on strategies to improve this situation. Unauthorized pay cut to teachers' salary is now a concern with no answers from the Education Department and Teaching Service Commission. National President of PNG Teachers Association, Aita Sanankepe, is calling for the establishment of an inquiry. He made this statement as authorities' concern have been pointing fingers and pushing the blame between state agencies in the Education Department. For the third time in three consecutive years, teachers have again seen their salary being cut by 50 kina. This matter draws concern for the PNG Teachers Association to address however the National Education Department, including the salary section, do not have answers. The PNG TA National President says who is responsible for this. I want this must be, report must be explained to the teachers in Papunin by next week. If not then, I want uh, the IS authorities, Education Department, Secretary of Education, let's, uh, let's call a roundtable discussion and then let's get to the bottom of this. 
with most of its members around the country affected and demanding answers, PNGTA sees this as injustice to teachers. According to PNGTA, both the Education Department and Teachers Service Commission have been blaming each other for the unauthorized deductions, a situation where PNGTA is helpless to inform its members. Are you looking after us or you are not looking after us? And if you are not looking after us, whose interests are you working for? Secondly, the Department of Education. Whose interests are you working for? The teachers or who? If you have no answers to the pay cuts of our members, whose interests are you working for? In a statement by the Office of the Education Secretary, the department is claiming that there were no pay cuts and for teachers to contact the provincial salary office for clarification. However, PNGT wants an inquiry established to address this concern. We need to establish a commission of investigation or inquiry, then we must do it. So the teachers must be happy and they must produce quality education in the country. At the moment, sorry, you treat my teachers like this. I don't think they are teaching. And don't blame my teachers. For we are police are failing to see into their problems. Jack Lepava, Jr., National MTV News. More than 30 women from Nautana area in the nation's capital recently graduated with certificates in body massage, housekeeping and other life skills. They were given certificate of participation after completing three months of training. The free training was offered to help empower the women. A small ceremony recently saw all participants receive their certificate of participation after months of training. It was a free training conducted by Grassroots Marketing and General Services, a business group located at Nautana area in Port Mosby. The women were taught full body massage, housekeeping and other basic skills to sustain themselves. We will share our knowledge, we will share our, um, our uh, skills to them that transfer to do nothing to do something. That is our motto. Do nothing to do something. So they can also help to feed the family. The initiative to train people on basic life skills started this year when a Filipino-owned business saw the need to educate people on basic life skills. In February, they took their first batch of students, followed by the second batch recently. And they have been using proceeds from their business to offer free training for the people. Director Laila Galura says there is a need to help people develop their skills. Papua New Guineans or Crescent community have its own knowledge, idea, skills, but the thing is no one pushing them to develop the skills that they have. Yes. Now we are here, the grassroots team, we encouraging you keep doing what you learn from us. The director further highlighted the need for women to be educated. She encouraged the women to use their skills to help themselves and dream high. Automotives or any training, women are entitled to join, not only for men. We need to be empowered the women. Like I said, dream high. Catherine Ebib is a single mother and a participant. She says the training has changed her life and she is ready to use her skills to support herself and her family. She encouraged women to participate in this training program. Me and Maslow, me studying this life long again. Also before me studying long and me ready long. Studying one of them knowledge and skills. With this training for women, there are plans to offer more training for men to participate and they are planning to reach out to other communities. The trainer says they are committed to empower women in the country. I will not stop. Nobody can stop me. That is my, my motto as of now because of what happened to, to us. We have a plenty of trials coming before this day. So I won't stop. I won't stop helping Papua New Guinean people. Rayon Lakingu National, MTV News. 
It's a sweet treat that the young and the old tend to enjoy. And for the first time, it's a special day. World Ice Cream Day is being recognized and celebrated in PNG. Tomorrow, Laga Industries, through its brand Gala, will host celebrations in Port Moresby and Leigh and will officially launch the latest Gala flavor, the Rock Rock Vanilla Ice Cream, made with Gala's Vanilla Ice Cream and, of course, the Rock Rock Biscuit. <laughs> While a lot of people may like ice cream, not everyone knows how it's made. In preparation for the launching of the Gala Rock Rock Vanilla Ice Cream, we were given a tour of the factory to see how this product is made. The process starts here, where the raw materials are brought in and the dry ingredients mixed with water. After mixing, it goes through a pasteurizer before it reaches the storage tanks, where it's kept for four hours in what is called an aging process. It's in these aging tanks where the various gala flavors and colors are added. After the four hours of aging, then we have the color and the flavor, depending on this tank holds the ice cream flavor that will be used for the Rock Rock ice cream. Here the last ingredient is added, the Rock Rock biscuit. The biscuits are blended and mixed with the vanilla ice cream, then packed, frozen and ready for consumers. Two products merged into one. We said bring it on, let's do it. Uh, and it took us four different trial runs before uh, we ended up having a product that you have all tasted now and are happy with. It's, it's really exciting to bring this to the to the consumers, and uh, it's a true PNG flavor. You know, it's very unique. It's our own version of cookies and cream, and uh, it's it's all PNG. This product will be launched during World Ice Cream Day tomorrow, which is being recognized and celebrated for the first time in PNG. Laga Industries, through its gala brand, is hosting events in Leigh and Port Moresby to observe the day. And residents in these two centers will have the chance to try out the new Gala Rock Rock Vanilla Ice Cream tomorrow. Lucy Copana, National MTV News, Lay. You're watching National MTV News, stories making headlines overseas when we return. Welcome back. Coronavirus cases in Pacific Island countries are low, but the pandemic still has catastrophic effect. Vanuatu, for example, has had its economy crippled by international travel bans, which kept badly needed tourists away. With school holidays in Australia, Vanuatu's picturesque beaches and waterfront shops would normally be busy with tourists. Now the locals have it all to themselves. I can't say that I was prepared for this. I didn't see it coming. Liz Peckins let go of dozens of workers from her five-star resort, but they're a fraction of thousands of others. It's been estimated at least 70% of tourism jobs in Vanuatu have been lost. There was a lot of tears from both those that were staying and those that were leaving. Jocelyn Garailulu used to run a successful handicraft store selling to tourists. I'm a widow and I, I need to keep my family going. My kids need to go to school and we need, to, we need food. Now she also spends her nights selling food. Coronavirus is only the latest in a series of devastating blows for Vanuatu. In April, Category 5 Cyclone Harold battered the archipelago. When we were encountered by COVID-19, the economy uh, was forecasted to be around 1.9%. And then with the Cyclone Harold, uh, you know, hitting Vanuatu, it was further revised to about 0.6%. But tourism will always be a mainstay for this island nation. So for now, there's cautious optimism that there will be light at the end of the tunnel. They'll keep hoping that one day in the not too distant future, they'll be able to welcome back international travellers. 
The niece of Donald Trump has given her first interview since writing a damning book about growing up with the U.S. president. Mary Trump says her uncle is unfit to lead and should resign. The family row comes as coronavirus infections in the country continues to surge, surpassing records on a daily basis. Donald Trump went to Georgia to spruik his infrastructure policy. America's infrastructure will be the envy of the entire world. His supporters seem to have got the message about masks. But his niece had a very different message for her powerful uncle. Resign. A court dismissed a case brought by the president's other relatives, leaving Mary Trump free to release her book and talk about growing up with Uncle Donald. He's utterly incapable of leading this country and it's dangerous to allow him to do so. There's infighting in the White House as well as the family. The country's top infectious diseases advisor Anthony Fauci has responded to continued criticism from Donald Trump's allies. They realise that was a major mistake on their part because it doesn't do anything but reflect poorly on them. The president has privately fumed about Dr Fauci's public statements but insists the White House is united. We're all in the same team. We want to get rid of this mess that China sent us. But the mess just gets worse. The record for new infections is broken every few days. But we're getting to the point where it's going to be full. We have gridlock and we won't be able to take patients in. They'll just be stacking in the ER. Retail giant Walmart says it will require customers to wear face masks. Emergency wards in hot spots like Florida, Arizona and Texas are close to overflowing. I now have first-hand experience with the crisis that's gripping this country. I contracted the virus late last month. The testing process is chaotic and it took days to get my results back. While I was in self-isolation in my basement in Washington DC, I heard nothing from health authorities who were supposed to interview me to trace any contacts I might have had. The experience of COVID-19 is painful and frightening and recovery is slow. But on a national level, the pandemic is worsening. The recovery hasn't even begun. Israel has ruled out as an early example of how to handle the coronavirus pandemic, but it's now facing a second lockdown. Authorities are reporting record levels of more than a thousand new cases a day, and a resurgence has spilled over into the West Bank. Critics say the country's early achievements were cancelled out by the swift reopening of the economy. Ignoring social distancing, 10,000 Israelis pack a protest in Tel Aviv, saying the government hasn't supported them through the coronavirus outbreak. I closed my business, I fired all my workers, and we are all sitting at home without any money. Other protests against the lockdown of Jewish ultra-Orthodox areas became violent. This lockdown is not necessary and it will actually prompt gatherings of people and keep everyone in one place. Dozens of neighbourhoods have been locked down and thousands of families are in mandatory quarantine. They are pretty much suffering because the government isn't really um, uh, supplying them with what is enough for living expenses, nothing. They're giving them, giving them nothing. Many cases are in poor, densely populated Arab Israeli areas, where some residents blame themselves. We must blame the Arab society for the second wave of the outbreak. We saw many people participating in mass gatherings like weddings and festivals. The government has come under fire from its own epidemiologist in charge of public health, who quit last week, saying no one was listening to her. The achievements in dealing with the first wave of infections were cancelled out by the broad and swift opening of the economy, she said.
Israel stopped the first wave of the virus with a lengthy lockdown that cost billions of dollars and raised the unemployment rate to 25 per cent. Now, six weeks after relaxing restrictions, the country's in a worse position than it was the first time around. Workers returning from Israel have triggered a similar spike in the occupied West Bank. The Palestinian Authority has locked down major cities there after cases and deaths rose. Torrential rains battered large parts of China, causing the country's worst flooding in decades. The Yangtze River is experiencing record levels of rain, the second highest since 1961. Millions of people have been impacted with at least 140 dead or missing. Raging floods in Anhui province leave drivers stranded. Workers try to fortify this flooded embankment in Jiangxi province. Wuhan city in Hubei, the first epicenter of coronavirus, inundated. And water being discharged from reservoirs like this all along Asia's longest river system, the Yangtze. Water levels of 433 rivers in China have exceeded the alerting height since June. Floods in 33 of them have hit their historical records. President Xi Jinping has called for the greatest efforts to ensure the safety of people's lives and property, but he's also pointed out that the flood control situation is very tough. The army's been called in to help with disaster relief work. These firefighters and volunteers at the intersection of the Yangtze River and Poyang Lake have been working overtime to reinforce the embankment, part of which collapsed due to the heavy rain. We'll continue to patrol the Dongsheng Dam and protect the dam due to continuous strong winds, high waves and rising water level. But the work will continue for some time yet. More downpours are forecast in large parts of eastern and central regions of the country. Damage is estimated to be in the hundreds of millions of dollars, adding pressure to an economy already significantly impacted by the coronavirus pandemic. Trukai Sports is next. Kilawani is at the sports desk. Thank you, Charmaine. National Soccer League Board Chairman clarifies window transfer of players. I'll have the details in Trukai Sports when we return. Stay tuned. Trukai Sports. Welcome to Chukai Sports. The NSL board opened a third transfer window after considering number of requests made by clubs seeking a transfer window period to allow for players who have departed due to COVID-19 restrictions to be replaced by new players. Board Chairman Benny Popoitai clarified that transfer window was under NSL regulations and FIFA COVID-19 football regulatory issues. The approval by the Kumul Petroleum National Soccer League Board for a transfer window has caused some confusion among fans as to why there is a third transfer window. NSL Board Chairman Benny Popoitai made clarification on the issue this week. He said the board's decision was done according to the NSL regulations and FIFA COVID-19 football regulatory issues. He said in Article 30 of the regulations governing the National Soccer League competition, it states that there are three local transfer window periods per the regulations. The first window opens one week prior to the commencement of the NSL season. The second transfer window opens one week prior to the completion of the first leg. And the third transfer window is at the end of the NSL season competition. In response to the coronavirus outbreak and its impact on world football, FIFA has announced that the organization is open to flexible transfer window adjustments while recommending the extension of player contracts through to the end of the season. PNGFA acting NSL manager Demirit Milang said with the competition set to resume on the 1st of August, the transfer window will be for seven days only and will be from the 25th to the 31st of July. 
He said the board decided to open the transfer window after considering number of requests made by clubs seeking a transfer window period to allow for players who have departed due to COVID-19 restrictions to be replaced by new players. He added that the players currently not rostered with the club are eligible to be registered with the club and players currently registered with the club must get a clearance note from former clubs prior to transferring without costs. He said clubs must prepare the player transfer document in advance to avoid inconvenience at the close of the transfer window period. Milian also requested that clubs send in master lists without delay before the close of business on 22nd July and failure to submit will constitute a breach of requirement and further penalty will be imposed on the club. Fidelis Sukina, Trukai Sports. Trukai Sports continues after the break with NRL and more. Stay with us. Trukai Sports. Welcome back. Reviewing some sports action from abroad and first up in NRL. Brisbane back rower Corey Oates has reportedly been cleared of a compound leg fracture after spending the night in hospital. The West Tigers thumped the Brisbane Broncos 48 to nil. Oates went down late as his side was pumped 48-0 last night by the West Tigers at Leichhardt Oval. Play was stopped for several minutes while Oates was stretched from the field and taken straight to hospital. Seabold, the Broncos coach, told reporters after the game the 25-year-old suffered a suspected compound fracture to his femur. Now it appears it's not a break and it's thought he'll have surgery today and could even be back in three weeks. In the AFL, the Western Bulldogs have bounced back from last weekend's heavy lost to Carlton. The Dogs thrashed Essendon by 42 points at Carrara on the Gold Coast. Bulldogs coach Luke Beveridge axed four players and it paid off. Debutant Cody Waitman scored two goals for the Bulldogs, including this sensational banana kick from the pocket in the opening quarter. It was his first touch in the AFL. The Bulldogs were dominant throughout the contest and blew apart the match by kicking five goals to none in the third term. Matt Suckling kicked two majors and Mitch Wallace had three goals for the Dogs. The Bombers dropped to sixth place on the ladder. The Dogs are now into fifth. Well, the A-League returned last night and it seems Sydney FC are almost certain to claim a record fourth Premier's plate. The Sky Blues celebrated the return of the competition with a 3-1 win over Wellington Phoenix. Steve Corica's side scored three unanswered goals after Wellington opened the scoring. The win was in front of nearly 1,800 spectators at Cogra's Jubilee Oval and lifts the Sky Blues 11 points clear of second-placed Melbourne City. And in England, West Ham have shown how Premier League survival is done thanks to a 30-minute blitz in the first half to secure a 3-1 victory over relegation rivals Watford. The win all but seals their Premier League status for next season. The Hammers started the day level on points with Watford, three above the relegation zone. Victory sees David Moyes' side, who have a better goal difference than all of their relegation rivals, move six points above the drop zone with just the two games remaining. And Leeds are back in the Premier League for next season after a long 16-year hiatus. Their place in the top flight for next season was confirmed by West Brom's 2-1 defeat at Huddersfield Town. Leeds will now be crowned champions if Brentford do not beat Stoke on Saturday or the Whites then take a point from Sunday's visit to Derby County. And there we leave Trukai Sports. Shaman will be back with the weather forecast for the next 24 hours. Bye for now. Trukai Sports. True Kai Sports. This weather update is proudly brought to you by Money Plus. With you always. The weather focus for tonight and tomorrow in the southern region. Port Moresby, cloudy with occasional showers. Kerama and Alatau, cloudy at times with occasional rain and drizzle. Daru, mostly fine though windy. And Popondeta, mostly fine with possible afternoon showers developing. 
In Mumase, lay light rain drizzle clearing then cloudy with chance of afternoon showers medang occasional cloudy with change of rain showers we work cloudy and occasional rain showers and vanimo cloudy morning clearing with mostly fine with change of afternoon showers in the new guinea islands all centers mostly fine with afternoon showers developing and the highlands region all centers morning for clearing with chance of afternoon showers the weather update was proudly brought to you by money plus with you always The way it is today, Saturday the 18th of July 2020, you have a safe weekend. Good night.